Hey guys, Pastor Ben here with another review and reflection. Today I want to talk about a book that I finished reading a few weeks ago called The Heart of Domestic Abuse, Gospel Solutions for Men Who Use Control and Violence in the Home. This is written by Chris Moles. Um, I wish this book did not have to be written, but unfortunately it does because um, as people are becoming increasingly aware, it seems like uh, domestic abuse and violence is an issue in our culture in general, and uh, it's an issue that, that pops up in our churches as well. Uh, we'd like to think sometimes that, uh, you know, it can't happen here, it can't happen with us, it can't happen in my circles, but of course um, it does, uh, because as Moles points out, the roots of domestic violence and abuse are, are, are in the sinful heart of man. And so wherever sinful people uh, exist, which includes in the church, um, we're going to see uh, people wrestling with this issue. And so this is a book that is obviously a heavy, weighty topic. It's not the kind of thing anyone loves to um, dig into or talk about, but it's so necessary and important for Christians in general, and specifically for pastors, counselors, elders, uh, those who are involved in shepherding and caring for uh, the flock of God. And that's really what this book is aimed for. Um, so Chris Moles is himself a, a pastor. He pastors a church in a little town in West Virginia. He's also a certified biblical counselor, and he works with uh, his local court system to um, provide uh, intervention and counseling and ministry to men who are abusers. And that's really the focus of this book. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and talk about abuse uh, in recent years, uh, both in the culture and in the church. Uh, some of the resources that are out there I don't think are very helpful at all. Others are, are much more useful. Uh, one of the books that I found helpful in thinking about abuse, kind of understanding it and understanding how to minister to those who are being abused is Darby Strickland's book, uh, Is It Abuse? I've written uh, on uh, her book and, and that topic uh, a, a time or two for Ref21. I'll put uh, links to those articles uh, in the description below. But one of the things that I haven't really found is a good book that's designed to help you walk with not just the abused, but the abuser. How do you minister to uh, the man? And it almost always is the man, not in every instance, but in, in most instances, it is the man. How do you minister to the man who is himself being abusive? And how do you understand what's going on in his heart and help him to understand that and bring the gospel to bear? And that's where Chris Moll's book uh, comes into play. This was recommended to me by a biblical counselor friend and uh, as sort of the best book on this topic. It's not very long, but uh, having read it, I, I would agree. This is the best thing I've read uh, on how to minister how to understand domestic violence and abuse in a biblical way, and then how to work with men who are um, who are uh, wrestling with that, or in some cases not wrestling with it. They're just they've given in to this. And uh, Moles' book is designed for uh, you know pastors, counselors, uh, lay leaders to help them understand how to come alongside those men. So this is not the book that you would hand to you know the man who is himself functioning in an abusive way, but it's really designed to help those who are looking to help him. And uh, that's what Mole sets out to do. So there's a couple of things he does in this book that I'd like to highlight that I think are really helpful and important. Um, th the first thing um, is to help, uh, again, those who are helping, to help pastors, counselors, leaders to understand what we're talking about when we talk about abuse. This is one of the things that I think can be a big point of confusion and barrier. I think a lot of people's kind of, you know, uh, assumed understanding of abuse is that it looks like physical abuse, you know, putting a spouse, you know, putting a guy puts his wife in the hospital or he's, you know, beating the kids or something, something terrible like that. But something that's very obvious, something that kind of it leaves marks. You can you can see it, you can track it. And that's kind of how a lot of us have thought about abuse. And then we also step into our culture and we find people using the term abuse, the category abuse in much broader ways and in ways that can sometimes maybe feel contrived to people. You know, just language I disagree with is viewed as abusive or oppressive. And so a lot of Christians, I think, either feel trapped by that. They sort of see, you know, one definition that's very clear and objective and then one that feels very subjective and very um, even kind of just more an expression of sort of a thin skinned culture. And so they can either feel caught between that or they can be tempted to, you know, just sort of fall back on that more, you know, 
know, straightforward black and white abuse means, you know, hitting someone else, you know, hitting your spouse kind of thing. And um, I think that misses a lot of what actually um, abuse will look like. And so one of the things that Moles does helpfully is to kind of help us, you know, biblically and just practically having worked with men who, who are abusive to say, what, what's, what's coming out of that kind of a heart? What, what is it, what are we going to see in terms of fruits? And so he spends time early on going through um, different, uh, different uh, expressions of, of, of abuse. And uh, I won't go through, through all of them, but he lists like nine different things, you know, and some of them are the things you would expect, you know, physical force or, or uh, intimidation, you know, using size. And this is where, again, often it is men. Men are bigger, stronger on average than women. And um, so there's that leverage in terms of power that typically exists. And so that's going to be one of the things that you see. But there's a lot of other things as well. He talks about, you know, how ridicule is a, is a tactic or a tool that abusive men will often use, putting down uh, their wife, um, you know, uh, speaking bad about their behavior or about their appearance or, you know, whatever, you know, isolating them from family or friends or even from the church, uh, falling into denial and blame. Anytime that they do something wrong, there will be a, yeah, that may have been wrong, but... And then they go to point the finger at someone else or something else, you know, using using the children, right? Um, there can be a kind of of chauvinism, uh, which I'll talk about again in, in, in a little bit later here, um, that can can play in of sort of I'm the man of the house, I'm the king of the castle. You should just listen to me because I'm the man, and um, often that will wear the the mask of complementarianism, even though, as we'll talk about again in a moment. Uh, it's a perversion of complementarianism, but we'll get back to that. Uh, controlling the finances, um, you know, um, coercion, threats, and there's all sorts of things that um, that can can present as the problem when you're looking at abuse. But one of the things I find so helpful is I think I think a lot of secular counselors who have worked with this issue will will recognize, hey, there's we're looking for more than just cuts and bruises. Um, Abuse can take different forms, but one of the things that is so frustrating uh, as a as a pastor when you read those kinds of resources is they can kind of say, okay, yeah, there's this broader definition, but but they don't really seem to push beneath that to say, what's the heart here? And one of the things that's tricky, of course, is some of those things. I think part of the reason why people will sometimes fall back on physical violence as as the as a definition is that it's it's more objective and it's clear. If you talk about things like denial and blame. Well, you know, who among us has not, you know, in our relationships and with our spouse, sometimes, you know, been in denial about our sin or sought to blame circumstances or someone else? Um, who among us can maybe not, you know, fall into some of the kind of patterns or things that are talking about here at certain times? However, and so sometimes people can go, well, that just, you know, it's too fuzzy to say that that's abuse, that's abusive. But I think what, what Moles does that's helpful is a couple things. Number one, he reminds us is we're not just talking about, oh, I was joking with my wife and I said something that was hurtful and that was wrong. And he doesn't just say, well, that's abuse. You know, we're talking about like ridicule, for example. We're talking about patterns and habits here over time and things that um, are, 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 are not being repented of or, or changed. So it's not just a matter of, oh, well, you know, my spouse you know, did something wrong and they tried to blame someone else, that means they're abusive. Um, and often in the world's view, you know, if you can label something as abuse, that is an excuse or even uh, a, a an argument for, you know, divorce. And so that's one of the things I think people in the church can become rightly, you know, nervous about is that if the, if the definition of abuse gets so broadened and the kind of implicit or explicit conclusion is, hey, if there's abuse here, then, then, you know, the, the, the wife needs to leave, there needs to be a divorce, then aren't we just opening the door to, you know, all sorts of, of things, all sorts of problems? And, and I think there's some validity in that. I think there's some concern that, that's valid there. But I think that misses something. And I think Moles helps to bring a more balanced perspective of saying, we're talking about patterns of these things. We're talking about habits of these things. Now, again, some things I want to be very clear about. This is, this is such a tricky issue. And I feel like I'm probably going to not say everything that I'm thinking, 
uh, and someone's going to jump in and say, well, what, what, are you saying this? Are you saying that? I, so hopefully I can be clear. There are certain things that are just, you know, very clear, um, you know, bright red lines. You know, if you are, you know, husband, if you are, you know, hitting and abusing your wife, that, you know, if, even if you do it once, you don't have to say, well, it was just once. No, that's wrong. That's sinful. That's abusive. You know, if you are, you know, harming your children, right? That's wrong. That's sinful. That's abusive. And actually all of the things that we're describing here are wrong and sinful. Um, but they may not all be abusive if there's not patterns there. So I just want to be, I just want to be careful about that. Anyways, I could probably kill this review by a thousand qualifications, but hopefully I just invite you to, you know, listen to this charitably and ultimately read the book because I think he does a good job of giving the qualifiers that need to be given. But I guess what I'm getting at is this, that I think what, um, what's helpful is to see that there's broader behaviors here. They're going to be expressed as patterns. But what Moles does that I think a lot of secular writers don't do, and even a lot of Christian writers who are like, oh, abuse is wrong, but they're just thinking about it's wrong to hit you know, your wife. Well, that's true, but why? What, what's going on in the heart of an abuser that's motivating him to use these different tools, whether it's controlling the finances or isolating his spouse or ridiculing them or hitting them or intimidating them? Why is a man doing that? And what Moles does is to bring us back to that biblical picture of, of, of the root and the fruit. And so he says all the kind of behaviors we've talked about, those are the fruits of, a, of an abusive heart. You know, the heart of domestic abuse is the kind of subtitle of the book here. And what he wants us to see is that where that is coming from, fundamentally, is a sinful heart that wants to put itself in the place of God. So, so the, the, the sin that drives abuse is not just, this is something he kind of, you know, develops at length in the book. It's not just an anger problem. It's not just a marriage problem. And one of the mistakes the church would sometimes make is to jump to marriage and marriage counseling when obviously there are issues there, but that may not be the core issue. And the, it may not be where you start. He uses the analogy of, you know, if you have a, a, a race, you know, a hurdle race, and you've got to jump over the hurdles, you can't jump ahead to the fifth hurdle before you do the first and the second and the third and the fourth. And so he's sort of saying, you know, he's an advocate of saying when you when you recognize that abuse is on the table, you don't try to jump to marriage counseling, even though you may need to get there eventually, Lord willing, but you've got to first deal with these things. Because what's what's driving and motivating that man who's being abusive is that he's viewing himself as God, and he's trying to control everything and everyone around him. And what you see in those fruits of abuse, whether it's physical force or isolation or financial control or just that male chauvinism or whatever it might be, those things are, are the fruits of a sinful heart. Those things are the tools or techniques or mechanisms of manipulation and control that a man uses to conform people to his will. And so there's a tremendous issue at a horizontal level, right? That will disrupt all your relationships. An abusive man will not react rightly to his wife or to his children or to many others. But fundamentally, what's the heart? The heart issue, it's Satan's heart. It's a heart of pride, right? Not a heart of humility. And so one of the things I find helpful is that Moles gives us that broader definition, but pushes beneath the surface to help us see what is at issue. And this leads me to one of the other things I find really helpful about his approach. Again, I think in the culture, there can be a more nuanced understanding sometimes of what constitutes abuse, but they don't get to the heart, number one. And then number two, there's often this kind of, um, again, implication or explicitly stated you know, belief that you know, if you can label a man as being abusive, that's the end of the story. You know, The next steps are you cut him out of your life, you get divorced, you take the kids, and that's it. That's all, that's all you do. And there are times where that has to be the case, you know, of course. But um, I think what that can miss is that there is actually gospel hope for men who are abusive, for men who are controlled by pride and who are trying to control and manipulate others in their pride. And that's one of the things that I think Moles as a biblical counselor and, uh, and pastor really makes an emphasis of in this book, that there is change that's possible. Men can change. Men can find redemption because the gospel is powerful enough to bring hope, right? Gospel solutions for men who use control and violence in the home. That's what he's trying to lay out and, and give us. And I think he does a great job of that. And so most of what he does in the book is developing and fleshing out, again, not just what the problem looks like, although he is trying to help you know counselors and pastors know what to look for and what to recognize, but also 
what does it look like to help a man move through that, to help him actually grow? Um, and he does a great job of that. Um, towards the end, he has this great, you know, chapter about, you know, putting off and putting on. That's very much the biblical pattern. You, get, you see that in, in Colossians and elsewhere. Um, but he talks about, you know, how those, those traits that we talked about earlier get expressed and changed as that man's heart is humbled and submitted to Christ. And so a man moves from violence to gentleness. That's what you're looking to see. From ridicule to encouragement. From from minimizing, uh, from denial and blame, to speaking truth and embracing the truth. From using the children against your spouse to shepherding the children. From that male privilege to servant leadership. From that financial control and abuse to stewardship. You know, in all of these ways, there's something better. And, and that's what I would want to say to any family that's gripped by this, any man who maybe maybe has the humility to look at himself and realize, I have abused the position, the authority, the power, the strength that God has given me, and I'm acting like I'm God. There is hope for change. There is something better that can be on the other side. And Moses is, is very clear about that. He wants to hold out that hope. He's also very clear that because the root issue here is pride, a lot of men don't really want to change and won't really pursue that change. And so I think pastors and elders, as they're engaging with men who are abusive, uh, need to recognize we're going to hold out that gospel hope. We're going to work with men. We're going to be willing to walk with them. But we might not see the change that we're hoping for. We might not see the real fruits of repentance. Again, not just an apology, not just a I won't do it anymore, but real change in all of these areas. We may not see that um, unless the spirit moves, unless that man has the humility to say, I do need to change. I do need Christ. Because that's ultimately it, is that uh, instead of being God, it has to be submitting to God and embracing Jesus Christ and embracing him as the model of, of what manliness looks like. And that brings to one of the final things I'll just mention here. Um, one of the things I appreciate about Mole's book is that he is operating within a self-consciously complementarian position. A lot of people who deal with this issue um, will advocate for egalitarianism. You know, they see any talk about male headship or the wife's submission as being inherently abusive. And Moles is very clear to say, uh, that's not the case, right? That first off, biblically, there's a clear, I would suggest, a clear um, statement of a complementarian position. Wives are called to submit. Men are called to lead. Um, that's the biblical pattern, right? Read the book of Ephesians. Read the book of Colossians. And yet, what our sinful hearts will do with that is often wrong. And so his argument is, you know, the answer to that is not displacing or getting rid of the biblical categories. It's allowing the categories that we're using to really be biblical, to really challenge and stretch men to understand what it means to be the head of the house. Because there can often be a kind of culturally imbibed, you know, macho version of that that looks very different than Christ, that looks very different than the Bible and so part of our work as pastors and counselors is to um, help people understand what that looks like. But that does mean, you know, pastors, counselors, as you're working with men, um, they might say things that sound right to you. You know, the man is the head of the house, the wife should be submitting, but then you need to probe beneath and understand what do they mean by that and how are they operating, right? Not as what they would say, but what you see in the relationship as you talk to both the husband and the wife. So I find that very helpful that he doesn't throw out um, those those biblical categories, but shows how those can be redeemed in the process of this kind of counseling. And so this is a book that I think does what it aims to do, helping um, pastors, counselors, uh, elders to know what to look for and in terms of the problem, know what to look for in terms of the solution, where you're going, and give some some tracks to run on, some, some ideas and direction and how to help men uh, get there. He also has a number of appendices, um, giving scriptures that help speak to some of these issues. He also has a, a one that you can you can give to a man who maybe um, is is being abusive or you think is being abusive that can help you to understand what he's actually been doing and help him to sort of see his behavior. And there's another set of questions similarly for the wife, which can be used. Um, to try to uncover, you know, is that what we're dealing with? Because that's, that's one of the big questions oftentimes, you know, that um, oftentimes even the wife won't know or won't be able to articulate if she's being abused uh, or not. And there's a variety of reasons 
for that. But that means that um, pastors and counselors need to kind of be aware of these issues, have an idea of what to look for, and have some resources to help uncover if that's what you're dealing with. It's not because it's, a, it's the unforgivable sin. It's not because people can't be changed. But you're going to address it differently than just saying, oh, this is an anger issue or this is a marriage issue. So this is a bit of a longer review on a little book. But I just feel like there's so many qualifiers that are needed. And, and I probably didn't give all of them that are needed. So I hope um, this is helpful, though, because I really do want to encourage anyone who's involved with loving and serving and caring for and shepherding people to, uh, to consider picking up a copy of this very helpful book from Pastor Chris Moles, uh, The Heart of Domestic Abuse.